Hey, uh, hello everyone. My name is Sean, uh, and my talk is about uh, kind of custom hand rolled crypto I found in the wild, and how you can also make your own crypto terrible if you so desire. So, just a quick who am I? Uh, I'm the CTO at Defense Storm. We're a Seattle based cybersecurity startup. Send all your logs to us, and we tell you when you get hacked, that sort of thing. Uh, I'm also kind of a security researcher, so in January I presented the uh, Lost Pass phishing attack against LastPass, if you're familiar with that. That was really fun because it was a, kind of a pixel-perfect phishing attack. Uh, that was a lot of fun to do. Uh, but I also like to do crypto. It's a hobby of mine. I'm definitely not like a cryptographer or anything. It's just something I kind of enjoy on the side. Uh, and that's, that's kind of where this talk came from. So uh, we're always told by security experts and cryptographers, don't roll your own crypto, right? If you ever find yourself typing AES, you're probably doing it wrong. Uh, if you're ever using OpenSSL directly, uh, you're probably doing it wrong. You should probably be using something higher level, something that's, uh, you know, easy to get right. But uh, it always kind of comes off to me a little, a little dismissive as well. Um, it, it really kind of seems like a kind of like abstinence-only education, right? Like, don't learn about this. This is kind of for us smart people. Don't learn about this, right? It's kind of like, you know your safe sex at classes, you know, don't, don't have sex, you're gonna get pregnant and die, right? And I was always kind of like, kind of miffed about that, kind of that, that tone of that, that whole thing. So don't roll your own crypto. I wanted to see like, when people actually, you know, roll their own crypto, do they make tons of errors? They make tons of mistakes. So I needed to find a place where I could get lots of custom crypto. It's actually a little hard to find. Uh, so, uh, we need to find lots of hand-rolled crypto, stuff that's using low-level primitives a lot. Uh, and I actually found that people are doing a lot of custom authentication. And where they're doing custom authentication is this thing called single sign-on. So let's, let's talk about it. I made a survey of a lot of different single sign-on implementations, but let me first talk about what single sign-on is, just so everybody understands. We're going to log on to some kind of central server. And that central server is going to provide you access to other systems without logging into them directly. So examples, OAuth, right? If you've ever used any kind of OAuth. Facebook Connect, if you've ever logged into a website and then it redirects you to Facebook or to Google or something. It's an example of a single sign-on. SAML is another open standard to build single sign-on. And some benefits, it's really convenient to provide, uh, you know, you don't have to build your own authentication, you can just use this instead. And a huge benefit is there's fewer passwords. Instead of having 50 passwords out there, you just have the one central system. Uh, so what's custom single sign-on? Uh, so what if you don't want to use all of these great solutions? You don't want to use OAuth and all this stuff. Uh, but why, why wouldn't you want to use it? Uh, it's, that can be a little hard to implement. Um, especially if you just want a few lines of PHP, like think if you have like a WordPress website or something and now you want to authenticate to a support help desk ticketing system type thing, you don't really want to have to implement tons of OAuth or anything. Um, so instead, you're just going to give a secret to both parties, one's the auth provider, one's the other one. You're going to combine it with some few pieces of info, maybe a user ID, maybe an email address, and you're going to produce a hash that is going to be seen by both sides. Let's go through an example real quick, and we're going to check to see if it matches. Uh, so just a, kind of a quick thing about OAuth, just to show you like why somebody would want to not imp implement OAuth, even though it's like the best, most standard solution. It's complicated. Uh, you know, we have, you know, the user needs to request uh, to initiate a request, and then needs to go back and forth, and then the application needs to talk to the auth server directly. Like, if you're just running some kind of little website, this is, th this is a big security solution, right? Uh, it's definitely the, you know, the right one for almost every, uh, for almost every use case, but this is why some people tend to not want to do this, or they ask for something easy. Just give me one function to do it. So let's, let's go through an example of what this uh, custom single sign-on looks like. So Alice runs Alice.com, which is a super cool website. Uh, Monkey's the user on the website, and Bob runs Bob.com, which is a help desk website. Okay, so Bob gives Alice a secret. Says, hey, your users are going to need this to sign on to my website. And, the, and Alice is like, great, I'll use that. So Monkey will log into Alice.com and does whatever that website is. Alice returns any cookies. Now the monkey is logged on to Alice's website, right? It's going to use the website like normal. But now, uh, the monkey wants some support, right? And the Alice doesn't want to build a ticketing system, right? So she's, she's bought Bob's. 
So Alice is going to say, okay, well, I have to log the, the monkey into Bob's system. So she's going to compute some kind of hash of the secret in the monkey and say, okay, well, actually go to this website, right, which is bob.com slash Alice, and that auth parameter is actually the result of the hash, right? And so the monkey's like, sure, I'll go over here. Now he's over at Bob's website, and Bob is actually also has the secret and also has the monkey, and the URL transfers the, you know, monkey's user details, and is also going to compute that same thing. And then, because they match, they're both the same, Bob's like, great, you're logged into the support website, and now you can file tickets, and the monkey can file a support request. Okay, so the good about this, it's really simple. It's like literally just function, very straightforward, hard to get wrong, like from a, you know, does it work perspective. The bad, these implementations are kind of all over the place. Uh, they, you know, aren't very well written. Uh, there's no standard implementation. There's no, like, best practice. This is really how you do it. Uh, and the ugly, they're really, really insecure, like really bad, um, really bad. So an example of one of the problems that you might run into with this sort of thing. This is actually how I found about the found out about this whole thing. So I found this this fix. So one of one of the vendors that does this published this fix. They said, hey, there was a serious problem before, and this patch fixes the problem. So this is a function basically that h function before, you pass a name, an email, and a time, and there's a shared secret outside of this function, and it combines the uh, name, email, and time, it concatenates them into this thing that it's going to hash, right? That's the thing it's going to hash. But then they changed it to have the shared secret in there, and at first I didn't, I didn't know what it was. I was like, maybe it's, a, it's used in HMAC, so I don't know of any HMAC MD5 known plaintext bugs. That doesn't, that doesn't sound like anything I know about. I, I, I wasn't sure what it was. So... Uh, I looked it up after it was r r uh, written up by uh, this cool uh, this cool blog post that described it. So this is the plain text that's authenticated. The name concatenated with the email concatenated with the time in milliseconds. So Sean, Sean at Defense Storm plus time, right? Uh, that's actually the same as Sean S concatenated with EAN at DefenseStorm.com plus time. So when they redirect to the website, uh, you know, the S is this, you know, the S doesn't matter, because they're just concatenating the values together, right? There's no delimiters, there's no anything in there, uh, and they decided to... Uh, and, and so the way you could beat this, if you had some kind of, you know, email address admin, right, you could maybe sign up with min at whatever the website is, and then change your name to have ad at the end, something like that. So the fix they had was just putting the shared secret as the delimiter between these two things. So Sean plus abcdef plus def uh, you know, defense from the com, plus the time, is not the same as these two. This fixes the flaw. Um, this is, uh, you know, a little concerning, and I was talking to a few friends of mine about this, like, why didn't they just decide to use delimiters? Like, why don't you just put a null byte in between all of those? That seems like a much more sensible solution. Uh, but th this is what they decided to do. But this has just got the kind of example of the type of flaws that you see. Like, the, the previous thing didn't look wrong. It wasn't obviously wrong, but when you uh, look at it like this, it you know, it's, uh, it's much easier to see, like, the types of errors. So uh, I had a few goals for the, the survey. I decided to survey a bunch of implementations. So I wanted to identify and catalog common issues, like which ones do, does everybody get wrong uh, on all these different implementations, uh, report on issues and have them fixed so that, you know, if they're using just a bare MD5, that they're going to update it and actually use an HMAC or something, uh, and then recommend them ways to use cryptography better in general. I had some non-goals as well. Uh, I wasn't going to deeply inspect every single implementation and find every single bug. I was trying for more quantity over quality. Uh, and I wasn't going to just recommend OAuth 2 every single time because that would, wouldn't be a very exciting talk. Um, and I also wasn't going to say, don't roll your own crypto 500 times. I was hoping to, you know, have something slightly more interesting to say. Uh, so basic stats. Uh, so I found 21 implementations, mostly just by Google. Uh, so help desk and knowledge base software are the people who use this the most, which makes sense because help desks and knowledge bases are almost always used by a website. So you have your website, it's a to-do list or a hot sauce vendor or something, and you want your user to be able to file tickets or you want to have a knowledge base about how to use your software, right? Uh, there's also two education platforms. So you, if your website wanted to offer training about it, you could then use single sign-on to log your users into the education website. Uh, so just a spoiler alert, only one implementation was free from every single problem, I, uh, every single type of problem I found. We'll, we'll talk about what the, those problems are. 
Uh, one implementation created their own cipher, so MD5, I guess, was too good for them. They decided to roll their own cipher, which is cool. We'll talk about that later. Uh, and so the total user count uh, for all the services is in the millions. This is very, very popular software. Okay, so let's talk about the issues that I uh, tried to identify. Uh, no HMAC. Uh, so what's an HMAC? So uh, a message authentication code is going to authenticate and validate a message. So the message is, my name is, you know, the monkey, my email is this, that's your message. And the message authentication code is going to authenticate that with a secret key. So why, why should you use an HMAC? So it's a secure way to actually combine these things, right? Uh, it prevents two main types of attacks, length extension attacks and pre-image attacks. We're going to talk about those in a sec. So length extension attacks. So if we designed a basic message authenticator, like we had no idea what we were doing, we would just say, okay, well, let's concatenate the key in the message, right? We have some, some secret key, just some random number, and then the message, right? So for instance, MD5 is our hash, or, and our secret key is ABCDEF, and our message is the URL that we're going to authenticate, right, for our single sign-on. So, you know, HTTP, whatever. So this is our resulting URL. That hash is the MD5 sum of those two things, okay? Should work, right? No worries. So in either of these ways, no matter where you put the key, um, if the attacker actually knows the output of the hash and the message, the attacker can actually learn enough about the state uh, to add to the end of the message without knowing the key. It can basically try to you know, build up the internal state of MB5 and then be able to add to the end of it. So it's not, uh, it's not super cheap computationally, but it's not hard either. It's, 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 it's pretty straightforward. So, for instance, the way this would work is this is the URL part. Uh, so this results in this hash, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to take uh, the admin false part and we're going to just append admin true to it. Like we're just going to make up this single sign-on thing. And because of the length extension attack, we can we know exactly how to change the hash. Uh, and then now this hash is correct, and we don't know the secret key. Um, so almost every single custom single sign-on that didn't use an HMAC could be exploited using this method. So, and this bug has hit Flickr, Amazon, uh, CDN, many others. Length extension attacks happen all the time. It really trips people up. Uh, and the way to fix that is just to use an HMAC. Um, so pre-image attack. Uh, so what a pre-image is, is if you hash a message, it comes out with an output Y. The inverse of H should give you uh, the message back. So pre-image resistance means that you know, the inverse method should be very hard. Uh, and then secondary pre-image resistance means that it should be hard to find collisions, basically two messages that same, have the same hash. Pre-image attacks aren't super uh, important in single sign-on, but I figured I'd cover it because HMACs uh, help prevent those sort of things. Uh, because uh, even if the underlying hash is vulnerable to it, uh, it this prevents uh, pre-image attacks. So like MD5 is broken, but as far as we know, HMAC MD5 is still safe. Uh, and it can extend the life of your authenticator. Uh, but, like I said, pre-image attacks aren't super relevant. So this is what an HMAC is, just if you're curious. So we have a key and a message, and we're going to take our hash function, and this is just a secure way to combine it. Uh, I have it here, hashing the key and then ex uh, exploring it with some padding, but basically uh, this is just th the best way to combine a secret and a message together and then generate a message authentication code. Uh, most crypto libraries support something like this. Okay, so what percent of implementations actually use an HMAC? Uh, only 28% of them actually use an HMAC, so almost, you know, uh, three quarters of them did not use an HMAC. Uh, usually they just used a bare uh, hash function, so they were uh, vulnerable to some kind of length extension attack. Um, and in my study, if you failed to use an HMAC, you also failed to use a good cipher, so almost certainly you used MD5, and MD5 is really, really trivial for length extension attacks. Uh, so using obsolete crypto primitives was another thing I studied. So did you use MD5 or SHA-1? Uh, without an HMAC, they're very, very weak. Uh, and there's really no excuse for using bare MD5 anymore. Some of these were written in 2013, like was when they were actually written. We knew MD5 was bad then. Uh, so I just defined best practice cipher as you can use AES, SHA-256, SHA-3. Nobody used SHA-3. That would have been cool. Um, but uh, so what, what percent actually used the best practice cipher? So only 19% use something other than MD5 or SHA-1. Almost always they use that, or somebody wrote their own. Um, uh, this was a little disappointing to me. I was hoping to see more SHA-256 out there. Um, and there was nothing that was a really, beside, besides the one custom one, there was nothing really uh, interesting out there. Um, like, a, you know, that's a, somebody doing uh, 
skein or something, something kind of cool. Uh, so short keys. Uh, so one thing to note is that from this earlier example, get bytes actually probably doesn't do what you think it does. So shared secret is a, just a bunch of hex digits. So it's like a 128-bit uh, hex number. But what get bytes does is it actually decodes it into like ASCII or, you know, UTF-8, right? So for instance, if this is your secret key, right, this is a hex number, uh, it's a 32-byte string. So what you want to do is you want to do hex dot decode hex of the string, right, which is going to return you 0, x, a, 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 b, b, and it returns you 16 bytes or 128 bits. Uh, string dot get bytes actually returns you the ASCII values of this, so 41, 41, 41, 42, 40, you know, and that's a 32 uh, length string uh, array. And so if your method is expecting 16 bytes of a key, which some of these methods did, it actually truncates it, right? So you only, you only use A's and you get none of the B's, right? Uh, and since there's only 16 possible values for each character, because they're hex, uh, you've actually drastically reduced the number of possible combinations. So let's do the math. So the normal secrets are 128 bits, uh, so now the new secrets are only 16 uh, choices per hex character. Each character consumes 8 bits. Uh, so 128 divided by 8 is 16, which is what we expect. We expect half. So there's actually 16 to the 16 choices. So to the, to the 128 is this huge number. And 16 to the 16 is this much smaller number. And so it's actually 2 to the 64. And I did the math. This is many nines fewer choices. This is like almost nothing. This is a huge reduction in the number of possible, uh, the number of possible choices. So uh, what percent actually made this error? Actually, a third of them actually made this sort of error. Uh, and it wasn't just in Java. People made this mistake in Ruby. Uh, but this isn't always a critical bug, because if you actually put a, the full 32-byte string into an HMAC, it's not, uh, they, they, they could hash the whole thing, and it should be still the 128 bits. Some of the implementations had uh, truncation, some of them didn't. Uh, but um, it's definitely sloppy. It's definitely a sloppy way to program crypto. Uh, replay attacks. Since these URLs are actually being like given to users and then the you know browser is doing the redirect, uh, you know, the, you can't trust the users. They might hold on to that. It might be leaking, right? Uh, some attacker might get that. It's critical they have some kind of time component or something like that. So this is really easy to do. This is what like AWS authentication does. They had a, a timestamp on the end and they just check to make sure that when you actually, when they receive the request, the time is recent, you know, within a few seconds. Uh, you could use a nonce, which is a number that you only use once. Uh, it's a little harder because you have to, you know, check those and ensure that they're only used once. Um, otherwise, users can just remember and then log in forever. Uh, so the percent that kept their hash the same each time, uh, this is actually really good. They, most people figured this out, so only uh, a few implementations had uh, static hashes that were the same every time. I was, pre I was pretty happy about that. Um, so most people had some kind of time component, which, which means that they were thinking about it. They were really thinking about, uh, you know, what would happen if these were being reused. Uh, so static initialization vector is another common problem. So instead of hashing it, you could just encrypt the text with a shared key. So instead of doing some kind of hash, you're just going to encrypt it, uh, like, for instance, using AES. Uh, this mode requires an initialization vector, which is usually just some kind of random number. Uh, and But reusing the IV uh, leaks information in CBC mode. It kind of starts looking like uh, electronic code base mode, uh, electronic code book mode. Um, when reusing the IV, right? Uh, uh, the CTR mode is another mode of AES that, you know, IV reuse is really, really uh, critically bad for. Uh, so only one implementation actually used the block cipher, and it was AES-128, and unfortunately, they messed it up. So the only one, so 100% of the people that use the static IV messed it up, and it was OpenSSL for Ruby was always their uh, initialization vector which unfortunately is just kind of sometimes how Ruby rolls, right? Like uh, convention over configuration, right? So uh, they, they must have written it in Ruby, kept it the same, didn't realize they had set their IV. Uh, known plain text. Uh, so in, in crypto, it's usually best to limit what your attacker knows, like secret keys. Best not to tell your attackers what your secret keys are. Uh, the internal state of your crypto function sounds good, like, right? You probably shouldn't tell them. Uh, and plain text, if you can avoid it, right, you should, you know, it's nice to, to your attackers not to uh, know what the plain text is. So uh, knowing or controlling the plain text makes some attacks possible, right? Um, it, it, this isn't always a critical thing. Uh, really well-designed crypto systems can actually withstand uh, attackers knowing or controlling plain texts. 
But if you're not using an HMAC, this is actually a really bad, really bad sign. So what percentage of attackers know the plain text? Actually, uh, most uh, implementations didn't have a problem with this. They had some kind of hidden component in there. Hi folks, I'm Geek here. Unfortunately, the Avenue seems to have frozen up, so we lose audio till about the 22 minute, 51 second mark. Sorry for the inconvenience. Base 36 value and I base 36 decode into a number, so 145, and then I subtract those two, so 145 minus 48 is 97, and then I ASCII and then I get the, literally the ASCII value of the key out. So this actually prints you from one, uh, one iteration of the plain text and the ciphertext, you get the key. Uh, so here's the function. Uh, the ciphertext is always uh, twice the length of the plain text just because uh, that's what the base 36 does. And so for every single character in the plain text, we're just going to get the base 36 value that just it takes two of them and then unreverses it. We're going to unbase 36 it, and then we're going to subtract the magical subtract function that undoes addition. Uh, and then we return the key. That's it. So what went wrong with this? So the ciphertext is strongly non-random. The first time I saw this without even looking at the code, I was just like, that's a lot of fours. That is way more fours than I would expect. Um, each input character always results in two output characters, which also kind of, from just a ciphertext point of view, just like kind of piqued my interest. I was like, huh, that's weird. Uh, the key stream has a very short period, obviously. Uh, there's no key schedule at all. Uh, they use ASCII values of the key rather than hex values. Uh, it doesn't use an HMAC, uh, use base 36. Like, it's almost like I, I actually had 20 more things to put on the slide, and I was just too many uh, more things. The other thing I wanted to talk about is there's no avalanche effect here. So, uh, each input bit should affect all of the output bits. So for instance, if we just change the first input bit, uh, we then ch only change one value of the output, so it's very easy to see what affects what. Um, ideally, each bit, bit of change in the input has a 50% chance of changing each output bit. So this, this would be like the ideal cipher, right? They look, nothing, they look nothing alike, they're completely different. So what went wrong? Basically everything. Basically every possible thing that could go wrong. It's, it's not really, this isn't really crypto, this is like somebody doing something 
you know, for fun. So implications for this application. This is a real application with like actual users. Um, so one attacker can, with one use of SSO, get the shared secret key. So you're, you know, you sign up for Alice's service. You're the attacker. You fight, you log into Bob's thing. You get the key. Now you can log in as the admin and see everybody's uh, secret key. You can see everybody's support tickets. You can see every, every, everything like that. Um, yeah, the authenticator can authenticate as anybody. So it's a really this is a privilege escalation attack just done over single sign-on, right? With this kind of crappy function. So I think from all of this, we really have enough evidence to say no, you shouldn't roll your own crypto. It's actually pretty hard. Uh, people make mistakes uh, all over the place. So just talking about overall results, uh, these are like the kind of the um, each category and the number of implementations out of 21 that had the problem. So a lot of people had no HMAC, a lot of people used obsolete primitives. We had the one custom cipher. I actually had to add that category during the study because I didn't I didn't expect anybody would do that. Um, I thought more people would use AES than, you know, that's why we only got the one static IV. Um, and so the vendor response. So only one vendor fixed the bugs that I reported um, out of the 20 that had bugs. And it was user echo, which is customer service software. So go them. They didn't use an HMAC, and they uh, they did it. And they were actually super responsive, so good on them. Two claimed that they weren't bugs, and these were some of the, the worst implementations, too. These were not like the barely, uh, you know, the HMAC MD5, which actually, HMAC MD5 is not that big of a deal. Um, about half of them never acknowledged, even re replied to my email. Some of them were, to be fair, like unsupported optional plugins. You didn't have to use them, so they said they weren't a priority to fix, which, fine. Uh, but I just, like, you have to think about this kind of stuff. And this is the sort of stuff you don't really think about when you might be evaluating, you know, support software. You might not be thinking about, like, oh, well, uh, you know, there's these crypto problems, right? So here's just a pie chart of all those things. Uh, definitely a little disappointed. I was hoping to get some more fixes in there. Uh, and especially because some of these have millions and millions of users. Um, uh, some big ones like uh, desk.com are not in this, and you notice I didn't, you know, name drop anybody, but uh, so desk.com doesn't have custom authentication in here, so like they're not in here, but there's there are some big players in here. Uh, so custom single sign-on the right way. Uh, first, you really need to decide if you actually want to do uh, something like... Uh, something like this, uh, because OAuth 2 and SAML, they're really, really much better choices. Um, they do, you know, par you can give partial permissions, You can, it's a standard, it uses good crypto, there's great implementations of it, it's actually not that hard to use. Um, but let's say you can't, let's say your core use case is supporting WordPress things, right? You really need to closely examine why, can you get your, maybe you can write a better integration with your product that uses OAuth simpler, but okay, because th this is really a very important part of your application. Authentication is critical. If you just let anybody in, anybody's going to be able to use your, uh, like anybody's going to be able to privilege escalate or do something else, right? Uh, so okay, if you must have it, uh, I recommend you do something like this. Use an HMAC, preferably with SHA-256 or SHA-3. Uh, SHA-3 actually, interestingly, isn't uh, vulnerable to uh, something like length, length extension attacks because it doesn't use the Merkle Dam Guard construction. It's actually based on uh, AES because it's Kechek. Uh, 256 bits of secret sounds good to me. Uh, generate this using dev view random. Uh, I actually had an argument with a friend of mine about dev random versus dev view random. No difference anymore. Just use dev view random. It doesn't block. Uh, it doesn't, dev, dev random doesn't do anything with like, really it just blocks and it just makes your application annoying. So dev view random is totally fine. Use that. Uh, tr really triple check to make sure you're actually using all of the bits that you generated. Uh, even if you're only using half, 128 bits, pretty good, but make sure you're actually decoding your hex and actually not getting the ASCII values. That's just sloppy. Uh, hash several pieces of data, including some the user doesn't control, like maybe a user ID, something like that, that they can't pick or maybe they don't know. Uh, use an answer timestamp and actually check the answer timestamp. There was actually one implementation that didn't check the timestamp, even though they had it, which, whoops. Uh, rate limiting requests is always good. This stops, like, practical attacks. And having a security consultant or a security consultancy actually review your implementation code is always good when you're doing some kind of custom authentication, especially with crypto written by non-experts. Uh, I just wanted to go through other dumb ideas for your crypto because this is the kind of stuff that annoys me. So using really weird block cipher modes like Telegram's IGE mode, literally the only people who use IGE as far as I can tell is Telegram. They're like a messaging app that does kind of questionable things with their crypto. 
Um, other things to do, uh, don't make impossible to win contests. Like crypto is pretty hard. If, any, if anybody's ever done a crypto CTF, like they're actually pretty challenging even when they're meant to be solved. And so if you create like a, an impossible to win contest, it doesn't really impress people who know what they're doing, right? So if, if I just say, oh, I have this custom crypto cipher and it's sending it to this computer over here and I, you don't know anything about it, it most people aren't going to just, you know, spend six months of their life trying to win your contest. Telegram did this. Um, you guys can tell probably that I'm not a huge fan, but uh, they, they made a, a contest that was just one user talking to another user, uh, and they basically said, yeah, if you can decrypt it, we'll give you, you know, $100,000, which isn't, that isn't how a, a lot of crypto fails, right? Crypto fails in side channel attacks or partial key construct, uh, reconstruction, they, 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 all these interesting things that, um, that were c completely ignored by this contest. Uh, there was another thing that I found, a uh, million bit encryption. So it was military grade and bank trusted. And essentially what they were doing is just a one time pad. They would just generate huge one million bit random number generators. And they're like, this is uncrackable. Don't, that's all crap. Don't do that. Uh, using a bad random number generator is a really great way to ruin your, ruin crypto. Uh, and making your crypto really hard to get right. So like, this is like open SSL, like open SSL is tough. If anybody's ever like, you know, use open SSL, like, you know, the actual, uh, like option to make it verify SSL certificates is true. So if you pass in, uh, it's, sorry, it's two. So if you pass in the constant true, which is defined as one NC, it doesn't verify SSL certs. Whoops. Um, so like that's, that's annoying and just stuff like that. You just really make your crypto really easy to get right. So, uh, stuff that I really like is like Libsodium and NACL from, uh, DJ Bernstein, that kind of stuff. It's much, much higher level, uh, type things. It's, that's really, uh, it's really nice. Um, and ignoring everything everybody else has learned about crypto is a really good way to make your crypto suck. Uh, so in my opinion, I think absence only crypto education doesn't work. Uh, because I wanted to examine why these companies made these mistakes, right? So, and I don't think it's because they're dumb. These are, there's, there's smart people there. This is good software, right? And they don't want to make insecure products. Uh, and I don't even think it's that they're incompetent. I think the problem is that they're not cryptographers, right? And, I don't think they should have to be. I don't think you should have to be a cryptographer or security expert to make uh, this software uh, secure. Um, I think we, all of us, have kind of actually let them down, right? We sort of shame people who are trying to learn crypto. Even I sort of did it in this talk because it, it was fun, right? Uh, we discourage any solution but the standard, right? It's either OAuth or bust. Um, but really sometimes they, they are too complex and that's obvious because people, I found 21 custom implementations. That's 21 reasons why OAuth is too complex, right? It's too complex for some category of user. Uh, and I think there really needs to be simple, copyable crypto solutions for these cases. This is obviously a common solution. This is a common problem. So people should have like the right solution to crib off of. Uh, I also think we need crypto APIs that are really hard to use wrong. Uh, really open SSL is kind of the best you know, the most widely used crypto API, and it really, really is hard to use. Uh, and I think we should encourage people to uh, learn crypto. I think it should be. Unfortunately, we had another freeze up and we don't have audio for the rest of this video. I'm sorry.